Thank so, you. Sure, no problem. So if you lose your password, what does Windows have to help you? The security question, that's one thing. Oh, no, the other security question. No, sorry, they don't have, there's no such thing in Windows. Uh, there's something else. There's a hint. There's a hint. They have a hint. They don't have a question. That would be nice. That's like if you, if you lose your question, you lose like your Gmail password, there'll be a question like what's your father's middle name or something. Yeah. If you put a hint question, is that the same? Well, I'll have to judge that offline. The hint is correct. The question's wrong. Um, because if they don't have a second question, like the mother's middle name or something, um, what else have they got? Uh, you can just go to remember to make a reset disk in advance. If someone else is the administrator, they could log in and fix that, change your password for you. But that's it as far as Windows tools, as far as I know. Now, therefore, if you really get in trouble, you never use Windows tools because they're worthless. You use hacking tools. So they'll look low right past it. And there's a ton of those. But I mean, um, this is what Windows offers you. Because, of course, Windows doesn't want to make it easy to hack into someone else's account. They want to maintain the illusion that your password will actually stop someone from getting in your machine, which is completely an illusion. If you don't lock down the BIOS, anybody can get in in five minutes or fast or less by booting to Linux. Um, but if you do lock down the BIOS so they can't boot from a USB or a CD, and you encrypt the whole hard drive in BitLocker, then it's really hard to get it. But if you don't do those things, the password is like the luggage lock at or your suitcase that anybody can just open with a paper clip. Um, it's a useful thing to know. Yeah. Is AES encryption more powerful than the BitLocker? Is what kind of encryption? AES. AES. Uh, well, I think BitLocker uses AES. AES, oh, is, do, okay. AES is the algorithm used by oh, most. Okay. It's the recommended one from the National Institute of Standards. So that's what most people are using. Okay. Um, and in BitLocker, then the question is, do they implement correctly? Because they might do something foolish, like store the key somewhere silly. And that's where that's what the issue is. The math is beautiful, but when you actually do it, there are mistakes you can make. Good. All right. So, um, all right, so what makes the guest different from a standard account? No time limit? Isn't there like no time limit? No, password, you cannot make a password. No, it's the password. Yeah. A guest account cannot have a password. That's the only difference. Other than that, it's just a standard account, but they can't change the password. Um, all right, what do you get in home locations that you don't get elsewhere? Home groups. And that's it, nothing else. All right, by Vista, this is a more entertaining question. What's different about home groups than anything else? And the answer is nothing. There is no difference between home and work in Vista. It's one of the many half-baked things about Vista that you didn't even know why they did it until Windows 7. Um, like Windows 8 has got a bunch of half-baked things that will probably be extensive when Windows 9 comes out. Anyway, um, so uh, what are the insecure, or which, which wireless security networks are strong enough to use these? WPA2. WPA2 mm -hmm. and WPA. WPA is fine too. All the rest of them are junk. WP, WP and WPS both mean anybody can get in if they want to. Um, but WPA and WPA2, if you choose a password that's not obvious, people really can't get it. Did you have to answer both of those? Do you get full credit? Yes, you have to answer both of them. Yeah, they're both good enough. But this is important to know, because you'll know if your company is using WPA, there's really no point pressuring them to move up to WPA2. It's, it's okay. You know, WPA has an enterprise version, and if you've got a million dollars worth of that stuff, you do not need to pay to upgrade it, really. It's good enough. If you have WEP, you do need to pay to upgrade it, because that's not good enough. Um, all right, so what network locations disable network never discover? Uh, public and work. Public. Um, Doesn't work fall in that category too? And I think work, no, work allows you to have network discovery. Um, but public blocks it. All right, any questions? All right, always good to answer these things. It's public that blocks it because then nobody can see your shared files to get there. With your work, you probably do want to share folders and files. That's the idea. Oh, I wanted to mention the midterm grades are up. So. Just click on the scores, and you will see them way over on the right. Um, I just took all the quizzes and homework up to this date, and turned it into a percentage, and turned that into a grade. So you got that if you care. All right. And you know, the midterm grade doesn't have any effect on your final grade. It doesn't go on your transcript. It is just to guide you so you know what's going on. If you're not doing well enough, you still have time to fix it or drop the course or something, as you may choose. And there's a lot of extra credit projects you could do if you want to make more points. What? Right. So, let's talk about more file sharing. Um, and the file sharing is uh, the same in all versions, except uh, if you have starter, you cannot create a home group. home group. You can only join an existing home group. And if you're going to use remote desktop, the computer being controlled, acting as a server, has to have a professional version or better. <coughs> so, um, home groups we've talked about before, this is intended to be on your home trusted network. 
and it can be used on machines with no password, which the other file sharing cannot, because the home group um, will create a password um, of its own and use it just for, for purposes of sharing. So home groups makes it very easy to share when you're on a trusted network, share your music, share your files, share the printers, USB connected devices, and so on. Um, but it means the machine that connects, that creates the home group must at least have home premium or better. Um, you cannot add XP or Vista machines to home group. You gotta have Windows 7 or Windows 8. Nothing else supports it. Um, all right, and the most difficult thing is that all the locations have to be home. And if you have multiple network connections, all the network connections have to be home. If any one of the network connections thinks you are at work or in a public place, you will block home group. Because of course, that's the point. If you have any connection to a public network, you presumably don't want to share your music and your printers and everything. So um, if you join a domain, then home groups are not entirely useless, but they change. Because the problem is they're afraid you will go, if you take your machine to work and log into the corporate domain, then you take it home and join your home group, they don't really want you to collect files from work, take them home and share them with the other people at home. So your home group becomes um, client only. You can see things at home, but no one can see things on your machine at home. So it, this is a kind of weird thing to do, but it certainly is it, at the beginning of Microsoft addressing the enormous problem of BYOD. Everybody is bringing their own home device to work, and this is creating a lot of problems. Now you worry, what about when they go to work and do work, and then they take that thing home and leave it in the coffee house, get it on the airplane, let their kid put BitTorrent on it and games and Trojans and everything. <laughs> You've got a big problem. It was so much easier back when all machines were like this. You'd go to work and you'd use that machine, you'd go home and use some other machine. Then it's a lot more easy to believe you're controlling what's happening to your data. So this is Microsoft's attempt to limit the harm on home groups, yeah. So is BitTorrent illegal? BitTorrent itself is not illegal, but 99.9% .9 of the use of it is illegal. So I, I install BitTorrent and use it to download Linux, and that's legal, but that's not what anybody's doing. Almost all the traffic, <laughs> but the, the installing BitTorrent and running it is not a crime. It is almost only, it's just like you can buy a pipe designed for marijuana and that is not a crime. You just can't use it. So it's, uh, it's the same thing. I thought it was funny how, yeah. like if you come, if you're coming from the Bay Bridge, yes. they have a big torn billboard and yeah. you're driving it. I yeah. thought that was the funniest thing ever. Yeah, it's not illegal. It's just a protocol. Like FTP yeah, is, right. like you know, FTP is not illegal. It's just what you would transfer might be. And BitTorrent, it's almost, you can guarantee that everything traveling over is in fact illegal. That's what people use it for. That's why companies always block it, and ISPs often block it, and everybody speeds bloody murder. It's not a crime, why are you blocking it? You say, well, we're blocking it because, you know, <laughs> it's, it's only got a 99.9% .9 chance of being a crime, and that's enough for us, but technically, you can use it for other purposes. That's why it's funny, because my job is actually really big on piracy. Yeah. But yet, they don't block YouTube. They don't block Florence. Yeah. Well, then they're fooling themselves, because that's how you do all the piracy. <laughs> anyway. Um, but yeah, there are some people that have like political reasons, like MIT ran a um, tour exit note until very recently because they really believe in like freedom of information. But they finally, so much nasty stuff was going on tour, they finally quit doing it. If you if you run a tour exit note, you have to put up with a lot of complaints, and a lot of them are very disturbing complaints. Not just copyright violation, but kitty porn, stolen software, stolen military secrets. You have to be comfortable with all that stuff going through your network if you're going to run a tour exit note. But almost nobody can put up with that kind of pressure. I only lasted a couple days. Did the DMCA take down notices when I ran them were enough to get me to take it down? Anyway, um, so if you don't want to be in a home group, you can leave it. One irritating thing is you can only belong to one home group. You can't set it up at different locations. Um, so, but you can leave a home group and join another. Um, you can disable them if you don't want people using this, which is probably appropriate for work machines. Just get rid of it. It's, of course, a policy setting a local policy to just turn off phone groups. Just like you've done in the lab, there's policy settings to turn off the control panel and many other features. That's the whole point of being on domain. You limit what people can do to whatever fits your corporate policy. Um, all right, so if you want to share with all other versions of Windows, then home groups are not available. So you can always do public folder sharing or any folder sharing. Um, these are just using the same sharing features that have been in Windows since I think Windows NT. Um, they just put a different GUI on front of it to make it look a little friendlier. So um, you're supposed to make sure all your machines are in the same work group, but that doesn't really matter anymore. Work groups are kind of just a useless appendix. You may not even know that your machine is on a work group, but if you go into computer properties, advanced system settings, and computer name, your computer has a name and it has a work group. Or unless it's on a domain, then it has a name and a domain. It's technically in a group. And back in Windows 2000 or so, you would open the machine and then you'd see them sorted by work group, and it actually mattered. But it doesn't really have any effect now. 
as long as there's a network path from you to the other machine, you can just type, our right, name is C21879. So if anybody in this room wanted to access a shared folder on this, they just have to go whack whack uh, C218-79. As long as you can reach the machine and you know its name, you could access shared folders that way. Um, you could also see it in the <coughs> network panel. Um, there is a networks, used to be called computers near me and other things, but here's a network panel. So you see the machines in the room, see a couple of them are turned on. This is how you find them. And this process is network discovery, what's going on right now. It is checking for machines that have the firewall and location settings such that they are visible to me. And if your machine in here is set to a public network type, I will not see them. They will not appear on this list because they blocked uh, this request. And this is going by um, that protocol we talked about. It is uh, link layer topology discovery. So if you go here, there are two protocols doing this. Link layer topology discovery responder is those machines telling me where they are, and the mapper is my machine, is the protocol of my machine to draw the map. So this is where most of what we're talking about today is here in Network and Sharing Center. So here you choose what type of network you've got. Uh, I, and this is a home network I'm on right now, so I can make a home group of this room. But I'm also connected to something called a public network, which is VirtualBox. And this is something, you know, this gets a lot of my students in the lab. If you install VMware, then VMware creates a couple new network adapters, and VirtualBox does too. And that network might be called public. Because when it first appears, you just click on some box, pops up, so you want to call it public. If you call it public, you can never join a home group. Because it thinks you're not at home. You're connected to some public network. So if you want to fix a thing like that, you have to run the home group troubleshooter. The home group troubleshooter is very good. It will solve all your home group problems, except if your hardware won't support it, which happens extremely often, like up in the S214 lab. Home groups just don't work up there. But the troubleshooter will fix things like setting all your network locations to home. So anyway, um, if you want to configure your network for sharing, you can, you can use these general features like change to a private network, but if you actually want to control these things in a more granular fashion, you can set up home group and sharing. You can set them up here. And um, let me get my, it's um, network discovery, should be advanced sharing settings. So here advanced sharing, here advanced sharing settings, there they are. Here you can do it manually, and you're doing the same thing you would have done in Windows 2000 or Windows XP. Now you can turn on network discovery or turn it off. That's new in Vista and Windows 7. But here you can turn on file and printer sharing. Now, now home groups are just file and printer sharing. What a home group does is it shares your files and printers and it creates a new account on your machine with a password that it randomly creates and you have to type that password to every home group machine. You could do that manually if you want to. That's what you used to have to do in Windows XP. You can either share with everybody, which means you give everyone full control, and then you only need to have a login to get in, or <coughs> you can share with one of your accounts, and then you have to go create that account on every machine with the same password to get in. That's all Home Group does, is do that automatically. So if you turn on file and printer sharing here, um, that enables it, it opens the firewall port, it starts the server service on your machine, which hands this stuff out. Uh, if you turn on sharing so anyone with network access can read and write in the public <coughs> folders, that shares them. So, um, Get rid of this. Escape. Go away. All right. I'm going to make that bigger. All right. So, all right. Here's the simplest case. Let everybody in the public folder. Remember, the documents container contains public documents and my documents. The point of public documents is to share with other users of this machine. But if you check that box, then all the users of any network can also get in the public folders. And that might be what you want. Um, all right. Then you can choose whether you want media streaming going on or not. And there's a couple other things here. Um, down here, you can choose what kind of encryption is used. The default is the stronger kind of encryption. Um, 40 and 56-bit encryption are pathetic. They're easily cracked. They're there for backwards compatibility with really old things like DOS. Um, you can choose whether you want password-protected sharing or not. If you do want password-protected sharing, then anybody connecting to your folder has to know a password which will be accepted by your machine. So you either have to type in the password every time they connect, or they have to be logged in, or they, and they can remember that. That's the first time you choose to remember that login, or you have to create an account they're logging in with the same name and password everywhere. So it's kind of a drag. That's why home groups are a lot more handy. All home groups do is turn this on and automatically create that account. Um, and here's, you can uh, choose to create your own home group account instead of choosing the automatically created home group account. I don't know why you do that, but you have the option. Um, 
And this has been around forever. Microsoft Windows XP had some kind of easy file and folder sharing. Every version of Windows, Microsoft decides it's too confusing for people to share folders and they create a new way to try to make it easy. This is the latest attempt to do that. It is pretty confusing to share folders because you have to give people share permissions and NTFS permissions, and if they don't have both permissions, they can't get in. So it's very common. You right-click on a folder, you share it, and people still can't get in, and people are frustrated. All right, so here you select your sharing options, which we've talked about. File and printer sharing applies to everything except media. That's media streaming, so this machine can be a server, and password protected sharing, which is pretty inconvenient unless you use home groups. Um, so if you are using password protected sharing, then you can create an account called share with the same password on everybody, or you can just share with everybody with no password. But home groups make it a lot easier. In practice, everybody uses Dropbox. Right? You do, this is like many other things we talked about. The Microsoft has a free solution built into Windows. And if you just go get some third-party solution, it answers your real use case much better. You get Dropbox, you can put it on your Mac, you can put it on your phone. You don't have to, it doesn't matter whether you're at home or not. That's, most people prefer Dropbox and Box to really solve this problem. Well, home groups are an option also. Um, so you can share from any folder if you want to. You open a folder, let me just create one here and let's take a look at this thing. If I get rid of all these extraneous boxes and I create a folder on my desktop, new folder, okay, to share. Okay, if I right click, share with, I can just choose who to share with. I can share with nobody, I don't know why you'd have that, home group, or specific people. So if I do specific people, now I can choose who to share with. Now I click here, I get all the accounts on this machine, other features and such. And if then I can choose for each one of those people these permission levels, owner, read, write, and read. So that's pretty obvious what you do here. This is, and all this is, under the hood, this is the same old sharing permissions we've always had. This is just another GUI to make it easier to share. It's another way to go. All right. Um, that's the game there. You can go here, well, it's not there, but you can, you can set up advanced sharing properties if you want to. Then you can control how many simultaneous users it has and what name it has in case you want its shared name as it appears to others to be different than the actual name of the folder. Um, those are fairly rare things. You know, I remember back Windows 2000 server was very annoying because the default number of shared connections was 10. And you would often share something and exceed that number. So they increase it to 20, which is a little more reasonable. Because Microsoft's recommendation is if you have more than 10 machines, you should get on a domain. But in fact, a lot of people like this lab have machines with 20 or 30 in a work group. It is a fairly common thing people do. So you can adjust share permissions. And these share permissions have been around forever. I mean, any of Windows NT. There are three share permissions. Full control, change, and read. And you can allow or deny them. That's it. It's much simpler than NTFS permissions. And it share permissions control whether you can reach that folder over the network. But even if you have a share permission, if you don't have an NTFS permission to read the files, you still can't use them. You'll see the share, it will appear in the network, but you won't be able to get in. And I think I can show you that if I just go here into my network. Um, computer. I saw some machines in this room on the network. These are, oh, here's a machine in Art Extension 183. This is some other classroom. So if I double click it, we'll see what happens. Somebody left a machine on in 183, or maybe D, it might be a printer or something. Here's Science 37. Let's open that one too. There okay, this one's asking me for a password, that's good. That means it's got network discovery turned on so I can see it, but it isn't sharing anything with the whole world. Unless I give it a right name and password, I can't use anything on that machine. That's what you expect to see. Um, if they had left a shared folder with share permissions turned on, but no NTFS permissions, it would show me the name of the folder, but it wouldn't let me open it. <coughs> so this one might do that. Nope, this one you can't even access. Okay, it's not really there. How about this one? Okay, there's an example. This one is showing stuff. That's me. No, that's boring. Okay. <laughs> that's you see. All right. But that's what you see. All right, so that's the game there. So that's the point. Share permissions let you access it over the network, but NTFS permissions let you do things like read, write, and execute. So you need both of them if you're going to get any good out of the folder. And that's why people get so frustrated. They try to share it and they can't get in because they don't remember you have to go through two steps to allow it. And all these wizards will automatically do both of those things. When you say share, 
with this person um, read write, it'll automatically open the share permissions and the NTF restorations to let them in. All right. You can share a printer, of course. Printers are objects which lead to print drivers, which lead to physical printers, and you can give them permissions. Printers do not have the same set of permissions at all. Read, write, and execute make no sense for a printer. Printers have print, manage printers, and manage documents. This is something I saw in the search exam, and I put on quizzes sometimes, and students always get frustrated. They give me printer permissions like full control and read and write, and there's no such thing. That's what you get. Uh, and so print of what normally everybody has, you can use the printer and you can manage your own documents. So if you print a job and you decide to change your mind, you can delete your own job. Manage printers lets you change printer properties like the size of paper, whether you use color or not. And manage documents lets you remove other people's documents from the queue. So at a company, you might take someone whose desk is near the printer and give them managed documents so they can clear out the printer queue and so on. Um, that's the game there. Default, everyone gets print, administrators get everything. I don't even think we have a printer in here, let's see. Print devices and printers. And there's a printer. Neat. <laughs> so starboard, oh, this thing up here is some should interpret it as a printer of some sort. So if I go to the permissions, um, I didn't see permissions available. Let's see if anything else here has permissions. Printer properties. There we are. So here's the sharing. Um, Sharing options. Yeah, but, yeah, I'm not. I share security. There we are. There's my security. Everyone has print, manage, manage documents, special permission, creator, owner, administrators. So everyone has print, and administrators should have everything. That's the default for printers. And the only thing you have is print, manage, and manage documents. The special permissions is probably not meaningful in this case. It means more in uh, NTFS permissions. We're going to talk about because NTFS permissions are actually quite complicated under the hood. Anyway, that's print server properties. You can also control what drivers are stored on the print server. If you have machines with different operating systems on the same network, which is kind of a drag, like you have XP and Windows 7, then you might have a printer connected to a Windows 7 machine with a Windows 7 driver, but it doesn't have an XP driver. Now, if the XP machine tries to print, somebody has to have the driver. You can put it on the server, or you can put it on the XP machine. Either way will work, but they're different. And so if you have a real machine that's just a print server, you'd probably put a lot of drivers on it. So it, it does the whole job to make your client machines faster. You might choose other choices. But anyway, in devices and printers, you can control the properties, like what drivers are on here. You can also control school files, which are where jobs wait while they're waiting to print. And uh, when it's going to notify things. Print management is a general uh, printer control panel. It lets you see all the printers on your network and you know see how they're doing. Something you do is you replace that with a lot of printers. So if you want to find shared resources, this network I pointed to, this is obviously your first stop. That's what it's there for. This used to be called uh, My Network Places in Windows 95. It's always been here. Um, what this actually does under the hood is terrible. Um, this is one of Microsoft's larger failures, which they've never fixed. This thing is actually run by two services. Um, if you look at services, here, um, services.exe, that's what I want. Okay, here services. Yes. Let's try task manager, we'll take into services also. Here's the services. There are two services that control this network thing. And they are server here. services that I have to see. There we go. That's the services control panel. There's server and there's client for Microsoft networks. Okay. This is what I wanted to show you. The server service. Go up here. Okay. This supports file print name pipe share. This lets you be a server. So if you want to share your files or your folders or your printer with other machines, you turn on this service. It automatically comes on when you share something. And then it listens on ports 137, 139, 445 for incoming connections. And the result is um, 
in, in MS DOS, every single machine on a network would send a broadcast every 10 seconds telling everybody it was there. I'm Station 7. I'm here. Look, I'm Station 7. I'm a printer. I'm still a printer. In case you want to print, I'm a printer. Everything would just broadcast every 10 seconds. This had the effect on small networks. It was great. You'd immediately know what was there. You'd go to whatever network control panel there was, it'd appear right away. On a larger network, especially corporate networks, you don't want all those stinking broadcasts. Especially eight or ten years ago when you had hubs instead of switches. It was really a bad idea to have every machine broadcasting all the time. So to prevent that, Microsoft created this thing called the server service and this protocol underneath it, which um, fills this window. And that protocol is kind of a drag. Uh, the protocol uses a master a browser election. This thing is filled in by a thing called the browser and it changes one machine to be the master browser for an election, and the one machine master browser is what keeps the master list of this, sort of like a domain controller. So every machine that connects to the network, within 10 minutes, it tells the master browser that it exists. And within another 10 minutes, the other machines refresh this window. So the end result is this network thing can easily be 20 minutes out of date. So you can turn on a machine, and someone's trying to see your fair file, and they don't see you in this window for a long time. They can still get to your machine by clicking start, backslash, backslash, machine name, or IP address. As soon as you connect, they can get there, but they won't appear in this window for up to 20 minutes, even when the thing doesn't crash. You know, that's the browser service, is the process that actually does that to serve what shares things. Anyway, that's, that's a useful thing to know about that browser service. You can often really connect to things. By the way, it works the other way, too. If the machine is turned off and it's not available, it may linger here for up to 20 minutes. You might think it's there, and when you click on it, it's not there. So, you can map a drive. Uh, just to make it easier for software to use it. Um, this is a fairly common thing you do at companies. Your local drive is C, your network drive is F or something. They tell you store everything on F because that's going to be backed up in this such. Um, that's you can take a network path, a UNC path, Microsoft calls it, it's backslash, backslash, server, backslash, share. That's how you actually refer to a server. But you can map it to a drive like F or Z or something, and that makes it easier for software to find it. All right, so remote desktop lets you remote control a machine. So you can use it. Uh, this, so this is a um, licensed, limited version of Citrix. Citrix is the king of this. Most companies that have servers that share out applications, they use Citrix. You can get a Citrix client for your iPad to control your Windows machine and do Excel spreadsheets on it and such. And it all works very well. Microsoft bought a limited the, the license, the ability to put a limited form of Citrix in Windows 2000 server. And they called it Terminal Services. And in later versions, Windows XP and later, they put it in the professional client as well. So you can remotely control your machine, you can play videos on it, you can use any software there, you can print on it, you know, from anywhere. You can go home, your boss calls you up, says, you need you to do one more thing, you don't have to drive back to work, you can remotely connect to your work machine and get work done. But it only half works if you left the machine on, and if the network lets you in. You have to have a uh, port forwarding set up on your firewall at most networks to use network address translation. So, and the traffic is encrypted. So if, even though you're sending traffic over the internet and it's showing your desktop and such, it is encrypted with pretty good encryption. So the terms, the machine being controlled is the remote computer, that's acting as a server. The other one is the client computer, and they have very different requirements. The remote computer must have a professional version of Windows. This thing has been around since Windows XP. But you, if it's XP, Vista, or Windows 7, you must have a professional version. If you have a home version, you cannot be the uh, remote computer for remote desktop. And you have to, all you have to have is that, and you have to have a network connection that can get there. And if you're going through network address translation and firewalls, that's not easy. And that's by design. They don't want individual people at work deciding to do this without approval from management. You have to get the management to forward the port to you. So if you're trying to just do it without permission, it won't work. That's intentional. The client computer, however, can be anything. It can be a Mac, it can be Android, it can be Windows 7, it can be Linux, it can be Windows 95, because the client computer isn't really doing much of anything. All the client computer has to do is run a remote desktop protocol client, and there are free ones you can download, which just sends the signals to control the mouse and keyboard, and then interprets the picture coming back to draw the picture. It's not really doing much, it can be anything. Um, it's, of course, the RDP client that you need is included by default in Windows, and if you're using something like Linux, you have to download the, the program, but that's all. It's, it's easy enough to do. Um, in, most, in practice, very few people actually use remote desktop protocol for the purpose I just described because it is too irritating to forward the traffic to them at work, um, and the only thing you use it for mainly is administering servers. 
However, there are a bunch of other products that let you do this, like log me in, team viewer, go to my PC, uh, lap link, PC anywhere is the old one. There are many, many products that give you remote control. And all these, by the way, are a huge security risk at companies, and they tend to generally block. Just two weeks ago, they, they blocked them here. My students had homework using uh, team viewer, and it no longer works on campus. They blocked it at the layer seven firewall. And I didn't complain because I think they're right about that. It is a serious security risk. People can remote control machines, send spam from on campus and such. Um, the right way to do it is what they switched to here. If you want to do this, you have to connect to the VPN server first and then, then use this remote control. That's much safer than only people who are authorized to use VPNs can use it. Anyway, uh, there are many other extensions, many other products that do the same thing. So the, the way the Microsoft product works by default is it listens on port 3389. You can change that. And uh, the, when you turn on the firewall, you automatically open that port, and then you can remote control it to anything that can get directly to your machine, which is anything on your local area network or anything on the whole internet if you have a direct network connection like dial. Almost nobody has a direct network connection anymore. Almost everybody's behind a router. So you won't be able to run any service that listens on a port unless you configure port forwarding on the router, something people that play games are pretty commonly used to. So that's the game. You have to use port forwarding. Or you'd have to use a Windows Gateway or something, or VPN, which gets you in. If a virtual private network, you log in there, and then you're on the local area network, and then you can go in without needing port forwarding. And that's what most companies regard as more secure, and that's what City College wants to do now, too, which is a good idea. Um, if you want to enable these things, remote desktop is turned off by default. You just have to go into advanced system settings and check this box, allow remote assistance, connections to this computer. That will start it listening on board 3389 and open the firewall port. Uh, if you're on a public network, it won't work because the firewall will not allow exceptions, but if you're on a private or work network, a home or work, it will let you do it. Um, and that's fine if you can actually get to port 3389. Um, by default, if you're in the administrators group, you can get in. If you want to let other people in, you have to approve their accounts one by one here. This is, of course, by design to limit who's doing this. And you can't have a blank password. That gets a lot of students when I do this in the lab and projects. You have to have a password on your account. That's a Microsoft security feature. Nobody should be using remote desktop to control machines with no password at all. This is something that would have done the NSA some good. Um, the UFO hacker McKinnon from London hacked into the NSA because they had a machine listening with no password at all. Logged as administrator inside their network for like two years. Everybody was just using it. Um, anyway. So you can connect, you start the remote desktop client, you put in the machine's name or IP address, and then you connect. You have some quality settings, which would matter. Uh, you can, for example, choose whether you want to share the clipboard. If I copy something here, do I want to paste it on the other machine or not? You can choose whether you want sounds to come back to you or go back whether you want printers to use your printer here or your printer there. And you can also choose um, how much quality you want to send. If you have a broadband connection, you can send high quality. If you're on dial-up or something, you can turn it down to where it'll only give you like low resolution and it won't be smooth when you move things around to try to make it use up less bandwidth. And that's the experience tab. Um, you can control how much detail you're going to get. This is set up for low-speed broadband, 256 for 2 megs. So it doesn't bother showing you the background image and so on. Another thing that's actually kind of entertaining is we will do bitmap caching. This last option here is important in computer forensics. We play with this in the forensics class. So if you use your remote desktop to control your work machine, then if you look in the cache, little pieces of your documents are there. It makes copies of images, so it doesn't have to transfer them more than once. So you can actually retrieve from a client machine some information about what they were doing that way. It's not very nice. It's like you're getting pieces of a jigsaw puzzle but it is an interesting issue to know about. Anyway, um, so when you're done, you can, if you try to turn off the remote machine, you will not be able to turn it off. You go to the start button, your only choices will be to lock the screen, to disconnect, which means I'm no longer remote desktop protocoling in, but it's still running, or log off, which will close off, log off. You cannot turn off the machine remotely with remote desktop. Um, and that's the bitmap cache viewer. And this is what you see on the machine if you're using remote desktop, random little chunks of their images stored there. Um, it's not as useful as what iPhones do. iPhones have a feature when you click from one app to the other where it shrinks down so they keep a JPEG image of your entire of your entire iPhone screen every time you switch applications. And that stays there forever. So you do a forensic analysis of an iPhone, you find whole screen images. This isn't quite that useful. All right, we got a few eye clickers about that. 
Come grab one if you need one. any good and that's not going to do any good. There isn't any client for XP either. That would sure be nice, but there isn't. So the only thing you've got to get to Windows 7, but you've got to have something that's better than Starter. Starter can't create the home. Yeah. One of them has to be at least home premium. So none of these are good enough. All right. Now, here's stepping around forever. All right. So I got share permissions and NTFS permissions on a folder. I share, give everyone full control and administrators read. With the NTFS, I give everyone read and administrators full control. Alice is connecting over the network and she is an administrator. So what access does she get? <laughs> yeah, I've been having this slide for years and years. Ever since Windows 2000, nothing has changed on this. But you gotta know, it. it's on the server cameras. <laughs> to notice here. She is connecting over the network. Therefore, she has to have share permissions. That's the first door she has to pass through. She's in everyone and in administrators, so she's in both groups. So what control does she get? Full control. control, right? If you're in two groups with different permissions, you get the sum of their permissions. Okay, now she connects over the network, the NTFS permissions, she's in everyone and she's an administrator, so what does she get? Full control. Both doors are wide open. She has to pass through both doors. If either door is shut, you can't get in. So she gets full control. All right. All right, that's it for that one. Let's go to the next one. All right. Um, same thing, but now the permissions are different.
It is sad. Why? Why? So she is everyone. As she first, first check, she's connecting over the network. If she wasn't connecting over the network, shared provisions would not matter. But she is. So it matters. She has full control, plus read, plus deny. So what does she get? Read. read. No, she gets deny. No means no. When you put a line like this here, that means you want to keep her out. So it doesn't matter if she has full control for some other reason. Deny blocks that user. And a box will pop up warning you when you set a deny permission. And are you sure deny permissions can make trouble? But does because deny full control mean it denies every permission yes, in the list? That's exactly what it means. Deny full control means you get no access at all. Deny read would mean you still had right. But deny full control means you have this particular user, you hate them for some reason. I want to keep that one person out of here. <laughs> and this is not recommended, by the way. My Microsoft recommended procedure is if you want to keep someone out, give them no permissions. Denying them can lead to unintended consequences, especially if you deny a group. Like if you denied the administrator group, then none of them could get it no matter what you did. That would be pretty weird. Yeah. But, I so, yeah. I the question because I thought shared, like, like I, I had to yeah. put on his network, but it's still shared. You know what I mean? I guess that's how I understood it. Well, you, you, you need to connect over a network. Mm -hmm. You have to connect to an object, and the object has an owner and it has permissions. And it has shared permissions and NDFS permissions. That's how it works. Okay. So you have to have a network path, and then you have to have permission to share, or you won't even be able to open that folder. And then you have to have permission to access, you won't even see the folder. And you won't be able to open it unless you have NDFS permissions. Yeah. That seems like instead of denying full control, that just means deny the access to full yeah. control. Yeah. Not deny all access. That yeah, there's a reason why. Yes. No, but it does deny all access. That's what it means. Deny full control means all permissions are denied. Just like full control means all permissions are allowed. And the reason this happens, which uh, I might as well go into it now since the topic has come up, <laughs> is because full control is not on the disk anymore. What's actually on the disk is 14 bits. And all these things, full control, read and execute, read and write, are a combination of those 14 bits. So that's why there's a special permissions tab. So what's really going on in the disk is more complicated. Full control is a shorthand, like a group, for all of those 14 bits. So allow full control means they're all allowed. Deny means they're all denied. That's what's really going on. Um, and we'll get to it, I think, in a later chapter, the detailed granular NTFS permissions, which you would almost never touch. Because this is complicated enough. But what's really on the disk is 14 bits of permission. Anyway, so she is denied share permission completely, and therefore it doesn't even matter what happens down here. She can't pass through the first door, and she gets no access at all. All right. Uh, whoops, whoops, whoop. But I can go back, ha. Huh. I can go back. <laughs> there. Now I can grade it, and the right answer was uh, A. A. All right, good. Okay. So let me see if I'm getting a little confused at full screen here. Um, <laughs> good, I think that's right. Good, I haven't lost control yet. All right, so I can go down <laughs> um, All right. There. Okay, here's another one. Computers configured like this. And it was, we're going to use this computer as the remote machine for remote desktop. Starter edition, that IP address, that firewall. So what do we have to do to do that? you can't do it with starter edition. You've got to have a better Windows version. The remote machine has to have professional or better. You cannot be controlled by remote desktop if you're a starter or home premium. Because that is not Microsoft's use case. Microsoft's use case is you're trying to control your work machine from home. They don't think you want to control your home machine from work. Alright. Um, Alright. And how about this one? This one wants to be the client machine for remote desktop sessions. It's got home premium. It's going through a router with the usual firewall. Thank you. 
until 50 seconds. Okay, so we're going to do that. All right, and uh, this is fine, no changes needed. The client machine could be Linux, it could be a Mac, it could be Windows 95, it doesn't matter. Um, the only thing is you would have to download a client if you use something goofy like a Mac or Windows 95, but Windows 7 includes the client. So be the client, all you have to have is any kind of network connection that gets there, and any version of, any modern version of Windows. You can even use XP. XP has a remote desktop protocol client in it. I don't think you get quite all the features, but you can still control the machine. All right. So we ought to take a break. It's 10-12. Let's pick up 10-25. 10 minutes to stretch your legs.